Marker assisted selection is quickly becoming an invaluable tool for plant breeders and plant geneticists. It allows the use of genetic markers or tags of genes which control agronomically important traits in order to increase the efficiency of selection for these traits. The development of reliable markers is an extensive process, including many costly steps, which include the construction of linkage maps, QTL analysis, and marker validation, which can take many years. However, once a marker has been shown to reliably predict a phenotype, use of the marker can save a breeding program time and resources. Use of markers allows breeders to carry out early generation selection, seedling stage selection, and gene pyramiding, all of which would be extremely tedious, if not impossible, without the use of markers. Now, many types of markers exist, including restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RFLPs, simple sequence repeats, or SSRs, and single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, among many others. Each of these has an, its own method of detection, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. Today, I'll focus on the most commonly used markers, which are SNPs, and I will demonstrate two technologies used in SNP genotyping and analysis. First, I would like to show an animation of how the chemistry of these assays works. CASP stands for Competitive Allele Specific PCR. This system has two components. The first is the SNP specific assay, which includes a forward primer for each allele. These forward primers have a five prime unlabeled end and a, the SNP in the terminal three prime position. The SNP specific assay component also includes a common reverse primer. The second component is the reaction mix, which contains TAC polymerase necessary for PCR to proceed and the fluorescent reporting system. This system includes two oligos that are complementary to those five prime proprietary ends of the allele specific primers and are each labeled on the five prime end with a fluorescent tag. As shown, one is labeled with FAM and the other with HEX. These fluor labeled oligos are each bound to a three prime quencher to suppress the fluorescent signal until necessary. During the first round of PCR, the allele specific primers bind to the appropriate region of the template DNA containing their SNP. Once the common reverse primer has bound, elongation proceeds and the first round of PCR produces a product with the allele specific primer incorporated into the template. Once the template is again denatured, the appropriate floor labeled oligo is then able to bind to first round products containing their complementary amplified SNP allele. Incorporation of the floor labeled oligo into the template separates this floor labeled oligo from its three prime quencher and a fluorescent signal is produced. The invader assay occurs in two reactions. The first reaction involves two allele probes and an invader oligo. In the first reaction, the appropriate allele probe and the invader oligo bind to the template DNA that is complementary. This binding forms a triplex as shown, which is recognized by the cleavase enzyme. Binding of the cleavase enzyme causes cleavage and part of the allele probe is released, including the SNP. This portion of the allele probe participates in the secondary reaction. In this second reaction, the segment of the allele probe binds to one of two FRET cassettes, depending on which is complementary. Each of these contain, FRET cassettes contains a different fluorescent signal. After the allele probe binds to the FRET cassette, forming a triplex, cleavase again binds 
And this binding causes release of the fluorescent signal, which can then be detected. Now I'd like to show you how quick and easy it can be to set up either the CASP or the Invader assay. Both of these methods only require a few microliters of DNA and both recommend using roughly around 10 nanograms per microliter concentrations of your DNA. So the first step for Invader is to array your DNA into a PCR plate. The easiest way to do this is to have your tube set up in a rack in the order desired. Then you can use a multi-channel pipetter to transfer the appropriate amount of DNA from your original sample tubes to your PCR plate, like so. Once you have done this with all of your samples, you can then prepare the genotyping mix. To do this, you will need to combine the compo both components of the CASP assay. This includes the SNP specific assay. and the reaction mix, which has your TAC polymerase and your fluorescent labeling system. Once these are combined, you can then dispense the genotyping mix into the PCR plate, which already has your DNA in it. Now, what I like to do is Divide the reaction mix into aliquots in a PCR strip. And then you can use the multi-channel pipetter to dispense this mix into your PCR plate with your DNA samples. This just helps to decrease the time necessary to set up the assay and increases the overall efficiency of retrieving your data points. Once the genotyping mix has been dispensed on top of your DNA samples, the PCR plate can then be sealed. CASP recommends you use an optically clear um, seal. And sealing is important because it prevents evaporation of the samples while they are in the thermocycler. Invader assay and CASP setup are very similar, so I'll just point out a couple of differences. For Invader, you must first denature your DNA samples prior to setting up the assay. This can be done by putting a volume of your samples into a PCR plate sealing it and placing it in the thermocycler at 95 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. While this is going on, you can set up your genotyping assay as I showed with CASP. This is just done by combining the components into a single tube and then dispensing them into your assay plate. You can then overlay your genotyping mix with your DNA, seal the plate, and place it in the thermocycler at 63 degrees for two hours. Once thermal cycling is completed, the plate can be read on any FRET-capable plate reader. A set of hypothetical results are shown here. For both assays, results are displayed with one fluorescent signal data for one allele plotted on the x-axis and the other plotted on the y-axis. If a sample is homozygous, only one fluorescent signal will be detected, as shown for the orange and the red data points on the graph. 
If the sample is heterozygous, both fluorescent signals will be detected as shown by the green points on the graph. No template controls will not give a signal for either allele and are therefore shown by the black data points on the graph.